John chapter 1, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John chapter 1, it will be in Luke 23, then Isaiah 53, got several places we're going to be going today. One of the things that I, I've noticed that God has instilled in all of us is that there are times we'll smell a certain aroma and it'll bring a memory to us. There are times we hear a certain sound and it brings uh, certain thoughts to us. Amen. Just, just a certain... See, y'all thinking now, ain't you? <laughs> See, I, I'm of an older generation where a match was struck and the wick was burning. And I think it was Peter Graves and others involved in a movie called Mission Impossible. Amen. Then, of course, now it's become movies. And all y'all know is movies. I remember the old Mission Impossible. There was no mission more impossible than one who came from heaven, born of a woman who came on a purpose to live a sinless life and to die for me and you. That was a mission that he was going to make possible. Some would call it impossible. Satan tried to call it impossible, but he made it possible. Amen. Oftentimes in life, there are things that are unfinished. Anybody got anything unfinished at home? Only the wives are lifting their hands. <laughs> Sir, watching you. It's, it's tough. When Jesus came, one of his last statements on the cross was, it is finished. The word was to tell us that. Uh, we'll talk, it doesn't just mean it's finished now, but it's finished forever. It has an effect to stay finished. It's nothing you can add to what he did. But he came to finish something. In our lives, we find that life's, and I don't know what's left for me to do other than what I do. In other words, I don't have uh, I have a cross to bear, but I don't have a cross to go to. He's already died for me. Wow. Amen. But he did ask me to take up my cross. When I think of this, I think in life, all right, God, I know what, what's going on in the next few weeks and months. I, and I have some things that are unfinished. An unfinished life, and we all know what it's like. All of us have unfinished things cluttering up the highway of life. The half mowed lawn on, on Friday. I mowed a lawn of the churchyard. I could only mow half of it because there's too much water on the other half. And it was wild because during the night, all I could think of is I got to get up in the morning and I got to go finish mowing that yard. Amen. Because there's nothing uglier than showing up at church and seeing a half mowed yard. Amen. Or at your own place. The, the letters started but never sent. A half read book that you've set aside and still got a marker in the middle. The abandoned weight loss program. You decided I, I'm going to do it in January and here it is in March and you're still eating tater chips. <laughs> the degree we never finished. The phone calls never returned. But it can be much more serious than that. An abandoned child that you've not reconnected with, or the job we quit in a fit of anger, the bills never paid, that are weighing in on us, the promises never kept. All of us go through life leaving behind a trail of unfinished projects and unfulfilled dreams. But few there are who can come to the end of life and say, I finished exactly what I set out to do. And that's what Jesus did. He's the only person I know who could come to the end of his life and say, with an absolute and total truthfulness, I have finished everything I set out. I did everything the Father sent me to do. Mission was possible. Can I get an amen? John chapter 1, are you comfortable? John chapter, see Brooke, that's that get up time. We don't get comfortable in here. That'd be all wrong. John 1 says, in the, the Word was on a mission. If there was ever a revelation that hit my life is when I realized that this book was wrapped in flesh and came alive. It's an amazing revelation. I mean, people go through life and don't even pick up on it. But in the beginning was the Word. I love this. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning. So I think about it. You go back to Alpha, the beginning, and you. as a matter of fact, God's even before Alpha. God got start started. Hello. 
there was no start until God decided start, start. And he got it rolling. So when I look at this, I realize through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. In other words, the mission came, Christ came, the Word came. The world didn't recognize his mission. When folk don't recognize, you, you ever been somewhere and somebody who you know didn't recognize you? And it frustrate you? I got upset at a certain preacher years ago. I was in a place and, and I looked right at him and he didn't recognize me. Later, I rebuked him for not recognizing. I've golfed with this guy. I've preached with this guy. I've done camps with this guy and he didn't recognize me. I chewed him out. And then later, I realized that he's got a mental disorder. <laughs> <laughs> and I should have left it alone. He came to the world, and the world didn't recognize him. They didn't pick up on him. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, by him, the world did not recognize who he was. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become his children. Father, I thank you for your word. God, anoint my lips to share our hearts and ears to hear, receive, and, and collect something today that we've never had. In Jesus' name, everyone said. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. The word, the voice of God, is so powerful. The voice became flesh. The word became flesh. It was given a voice. The logos. This is a logo. Amen. The the Bible. This the word is is literally the logo. And then then when it becomes alive, it becomes rhema. And that's a, that's a simple thing. I've talked to you for years about it. But when rhema comes alive inside of you, it's that word that keeps you from being afraid. It's that word that gives you boldness to go on. It's that word that tells you that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. It's the word that tells you that Christ in you, he's inside of you. So this is when it becomes alive to you. So the flesh became alive. The logo expresses the intent, purpose, and plan of the organization. But God said this time, you wouldn't only hear the word, but you're going to see the word. Ramah's going to come over, and his name will be Jesus. When you have that revelation of the word, that the Word was God and nothing was created without the Word. The, the Word is life and light. That's why I'm, 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 I want you to be biblically literate, not illiterate. When you think Bible, then you realize how skewed, how messed up our government is, our state officials are. They say things that are so contrary to the book. And when it happens, you, you need to rise up. You need to refuse that. That's foolishness. That's why when we, went, when we went through the pandemic, I just stood on Psalm 91. You know, I had to. I had to go Bible. Every now and then, you just got to go Bible. Amen? And not what the world is saying to you. So Jesus reinstated the voice of God back to man. Now listen, how creation, how did creation, he created the world. How did creation react to his voice? In the boat, we know that he spoke to the wind and the waves. He said, be still, and the waters were still. When he saw Peter, he told Peter to come. Amen. Peter gets out of the boat. To Lazarus in a loud voice, he spoke to death and said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus comes out of the tomb. It is more of a miracle for something not to happen when Jesus spoke than for it to happen. Because when he said, light be, it be. When he said, wind be still, it's still. When he said, tree die, it die. It's on the heel of this that Jesus spins and says to them, I say to you, have faith in God. If you say to a mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, it's going to move. That's why the voice of God is so important. That's why it's important for you to learn the Word of God. Amen. So now we've had Jesus. We've had him in the garden. We've had him beaten. Amen. We've had him into a, a place of a into the courtyard. On his way to the courtyard, he looked over and saw Peter. You remember last week, we talked about Malchus's ear being removed. Why was Malchus, why did Jesus put Malchus's ear back on? It wasn't for Malchus, it was for Peter. He did it, why? To remove all evidence that there was ever a crime. When God forgives you of sin, he removes all evidence that there was ever a crime. Can you get an amen? amen. Powerful statement there, preacher. I know it was really good. I enjoyed it last week too. <laughs> so now he's on a mission. Everybody say a mission. When you're on a mission, 
for God. Amen. It matters. Dun, 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 dun. It matters. So he's on a mission here. Amen. And he's going through the way of Via Della Rosa. The word Via Della Rosa, I remember as a, little, as a young boy in the, uh, third grade, we had a teacher, fourth grade, we had a teacher named Miss Booker. And Miss Booker always took you on a trip to the uh, Ava Grotto. I don't know H where it was, somewhere around Huntsville, uh, Athens or Huntsville, but it was uh, Ava Maria Grotto. She, you ever had a teacher that just loved Jesus? I did. Miss Booker loved Jesus. And she would teach us and talk to us. She said, it's funny how she was the hardest teacher I ever had. I don't remember any of the soft teachers. I just remember the one that always spanked us on our birthday. <laughs> she would whoop you on your birthday. I said for so seventh grade. And in the seventh grade, she'd take us to this Ava Maria Grotto. And it was a, a small picture of, of, of Christ going through Via Della Rosa. It was uh, little statues and things. Like, and I, as a lo- young boy, I thought, this here, uh, I, uh, I don't understand any of this stuff. And as I got older, I recognized what she was doing. She was trying to impart into this young brain that there's more to life than what you're getting up here on Wheeler Mountain. Amen. There's a lot more to life. So he's on a mission. Somebody bump the coolant up in this building just a little bit, if you would. Amen. Some of you, if you've got a coat, hug it. Because I'm starting to sweat up here, and HD's starting to sleep. Uh, Another, another, I love our church. (laughs) A lot of folk couldn't do this, but I mean, I know you. Another carried his cross. Luke 23, 26. As they led him away, they see Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. I've often looked at this a little different than others. I felt like, when they took the cross from Jesus, it's why he came, was to carry the cross. And when they re- removed it from him, it was a part of a punishment. In other words, he would have carried it all the way. I know he was tired. I know he was weak. I know he'd, he was bloody. But I believe it was a part of what he wanted to do. And they yanked it off of his back, and they gave it to Simon and Cyrene. It had been a long night, a lack of sleep, the trials, the mockery, the loss of blood in the garden, the scourging of his back and in his frontal, amen, the beating, his beard plucked, and now Simon is carrying the cross. Luke 23, 32 said, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, where they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. The crucifixion, and I know this is not Easter Sunday. I'm setting this thing up for next week, but i got to tell you, the crucifixion was his hands. Used to heal, that broke the bread, that blessed the children, the place of concentrated nerves. They drove a spike through the muscle and the nerves. The feet used to carry the good news. Spike drove through them. No Novocaine at Calvary. His back, his stomach, his face torn, thorns piercing his head, hands and feet pinned to the wood, picked up and dropped in. Now, could he finish this mission? Is it possible for you to finish what you came to do? And his words, his words, seven sayings on that cross. He was crucified at 9 a.m. He was taken down at 3 p.m. Six hours of, 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 of humiliation, six hours of excruciating. The first utterances demonstrated the love of God. His prayer was not for himself but for murderers. I'm going to tell you something. If somebody hit you and slapped you, if somebody beat you, your words would not be to bless them. It would be about you. It's always about us. And we, we get this and we got to fight through all of this. But his first words were, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They have no idea what they're doing here. The action of, of mediating between two disputing people or groups to conciliate, reconciliation. He prayed for his murderers. If there's one thing I love to see in life is when children and parents reconcile, when siblings reconcile. And listen, it's happened in my life. I've, been, I've had distance between my, my family at times with my kids. But that reconciliation moment is one of the most powerful things. And Jesus on the cross, Father... Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They ain't got no idea. I came here for a mission to fulfill. Isaiah said it like this. 
2,000 years before Jesus came, the prophet Isaiah said in 53, Therefore I will give him a portion among the great. He will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He prayed for his transgressors. When's the last time you prayed for somebody who'd been doing you wrong? Instead of humiliating them or slamming them on social media, pray for them. Ask God to help them, change them, turn them around. It says also in verse 12 in the, the Message Bible, Therefore I'm going to reward him extravagantly, the best of everything, the highest honors, because he looked death in the face and didn't flinch, because he embraced the company of the lowest. He took on his own shoulders the sin of many. He took up the cause of all the black sheep. When I think about being a black sheep, and that's what I am, I am that of my family. The first one who got born again, hey, man, my life changed. And you say, well, that, that sounds like a white sheep. No, 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 it's black sheep. Ostracized, laughed at, put down. Why don't you just, you know, go to church with other people? Why you got to act so different than others? Because God turned my life around. He changed me. Hey, man, he gave me a hope and a future. But when I read this here, I think to myself, what heaven was going to be like when Jesus came back? When he came back from the dead, extravagantly, God said, I'm going to reward him. I'm going, I'm going to do it. I'm going to bless him. And then the conversion. There on the cross, he said, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. There's something absolutely uh, amazing from him to look down first at the people and say, God, forgive them. And then second on the cross to look over at two thieves. Now, you guys, you know, I got a lot to preach today and to lay out before you. I can preach each one of these statements as a sermon and have but I'm going to throw them all together today all right we've got a lot to cover so Brooke there were two people one on each side of Jesus two thieves hmm. they began to hurl one did accusations at him I got to say he had to be on the left side <laughs> let's call him a liberal <laughs> I want to keep living any way I want but forgive me so there he was on the left side. He began to hurl accusations. If, you, if you're the son of God, get yourself off here and me. Selfish. Selfish. Two of them. John 19. Near the cross of Jesus stood. Oh, I, I'm, I'm moving too far here. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them, today you'll be with me in prayer. One guy said to him, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, in my mind's eye, I see a cross in the middle. And I see these two crosses cut it like a wing in such a way that one could look over and see over the, the head of Christ, this is the king of the Jews. And at that moment, he looks at Christ and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Because if you're a king, you've got to have a kingdom. And evidently, it's not of this world. And Jesus said today, everybody say today. Man, that word today means so much to me. Today you'll be with me in paradise. You cannot come off this cross. You can't help anybody. You can't do any good deeds. Amen. You can't, you can't work your way into this. All you got to do is accept me and what I'm doing here today. These two men who were crucified on the outer crosses, they differed on one main point and how they viewed the man in the middle. They saw him differently. One man wanted escape, not forgiveness. The other man wanted forgiveness not escape. As a matter of fact, he said, I'm worthy to be killed. What I've done deserves the fact that they're going to take me out of this place. Amen. At that moment today. So now Jesus is forgiving the people. Amen. Forgiving this man and then his mama. Even this morning on the phone, I was talking to Pastor David Clowers in Oklahoma City. And he said to me, how is your mama? I get that all the time. How's your mama? My mama's getting close to the end. She's in a wheelchair. I talked to my brother this week. How's mama? He said, I'm taking care of mama. Thank you. Because I can't be there. Maria can't be there. And I think of what Jesus said here. When he looked down at John knowing he couldn't be there. And Bobby said, you take care of mama. You take care of mama. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clophus, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, 
and the disciple whom he loved. Who wrote this? Yeah. And the disciple whom Jesus, whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to her, woman, there's, here's your son. And to the disciple, here's your mother. From that time on, the disciple took care of her. He released responsibility to John. In other words, I know I'm leaving. Mama knows who I am. I'm the son of God. Amen. She knows she's virgin when she had me. She knows all about me. Amen. So at that moment, he releases that responsibility. But I could preach a lot on this one. But the responsibility of us to our parents, and then hopefully one day our kids back to us. You may hold her, but someday she's going to be holding you. It's an amazing thought as we move through life, how life shifts and changes. Amen. Take care, Mama. And then the last four sayings of Christ were from the sixth to the ninth hour, from 12 to 3. The cry. I mean, the cry at the, close to the end of his life there. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He didn't call him Father this time. He called him God. He, man, he mentions him. Again, Isaiah said, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offering and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. It was the will of God. I remember when I first got born again, I was reading through Isaiah. And I read that passage and it hit me. It hit me like a rock, man. That Jesus died so that God could have many sons and daughters. He was crushed for us. And that's literally what happened on the cross. I call it the bottom of the cup. It was here, the dregs in the bottom of the cup. Amen. It was one thing to be betrayed, to be deserted. It was another thing to be beaten. But this here, the bitter part, is when the Father turned his back on him because the sins of the world were put upon him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And understand, he didn't say, oh, God. He said, my God. No matter what you've gone through in life, remind yourself, he's still your God. Amen. Amen. No matter how much trouble has happened. Second Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Everything that you are, God has blessed you with, is because of what Jesus did on that cross. The craving while he was there. The thirst. The thirst. Isn't water a wonderful thing? I've discovered it. I'm 63 years old, and I'm just now discovering water. This girl right here, my daughter, she can drink water like no man I have ever met. And she's a woman. She will drink water. Johnny, never seen nothing like it. She will go up down. I dare you to challenge her. She will outdrink you in water. It's amazing. This here that God put on this earth is one of the most amazing liquids there is. Uh, this is more valuable than gold. You'll want this more than, you'll trade anything for this when you're thirsty. And imagine, some of you can barely get through a church service without a gulp. You just, you, you see this, and even right now you're thinking about either drink or I got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> there on the cross, with his clothing removed and blood covering his body. <sighs> he's sweat. He's bled. And now he's thirsty. Finally, all night, through the trials, the beatings, 9 o'clock crucifixion, 12 o'clock high sun. Now it's moving closer to 2.30, closer to 3.00. Jesus finally says something about himself. He said, I thirst. I'm, 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 I'm thirsty. When Jesus said, I, did I tell you about the voice, the power of the word? When he said, I thirst, it clouded up. Not just over Jerusalem, but when you understand the Greek language, it clouded up all over the earth. The whole earth was in darkness. It was, like, it was like heaven itself said, let me help him. Let me give him drink. 
it clouded. The, the rains started gathering up at that moment. Dark, later knowing that all was now completed, his mission so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they, they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted it up to his lips. Psalm 69, verse 20 says, Reproach hath broken my heart. And I love the fact that you can take this New Testament, then you go to the Old Testament and find it again. He's broken my heart, and I'm full of heaviness, and I look for some to take pity. There was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. At that moment, it wetted his lips. And again, if you looked at it close enough, you'd realize that he tasted it, but he didn't swallow. He's probably unable to swallow at this time. His throat is probably swollen up, but he tasted it many times, and it's, and it's bitter. It's bitter. Oh, that God gave you these taste buds, sweet and salty and bitter. And you can taste bitter. When you hit bitter, you give a child, you have done this because y'all are cruel parents. You've given that child a lemon before. Yeah, a slice of, why? Just to watch your face. <laughs> don't, don't laugh, you did it too. We've all done it. Hey Amen. We've all watched that moment. With it. It, it, and Jesus tastes the bitter. But here's the issue in life. Taste the bitter, don't swallow it. Don't, 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 don't ingest it. Don't let it destroy you. Amen. And then the conquering. Come on up, Joe. The finishing of the mission. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it's finished. With that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. The last statement on the cross was, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. His physical sufferings had reached the climax. The pain now unbearable. Breathing is almost impossible. The crowd gathers like vultures circling the prey. The friends of Jesus watch in horror as his life ebbs away. Death rattles in his throat. From somewhere down below, a fiendish evil howling from the bowels of hell. The angels look away. The Son of God's about to die. And Jesus yells in his language to tell us, die. Interpret it, it is finished. Not I am, it. What I came to finish, I finished. The mission is possible. The word telestai comes from the word teleo, which means to bring to an end, to complete, to accomplish. It's, it's a crucial word because it signifies the successful end to a particular course of action, mission accomplished. It's different from the past tense, which looks back to an event and says, this happened. It's the perfect tense, which adds, this happened and is still in effect today. What he finished then is still finished today in 2023, uh, 2024. When Jesus cried it out, he meant it was finished in the past, it's finished in the present, and it will remain finished in the future. One other fact note here, he didn't say, again, I am, but it is. To tell us I is the Savior's final cry. When he died, he left no unfinished business behind. When he said it, he meant it. The death and the resurrection of Christ provided a full satisfaction for our sin. You ain't barely saved. You ain't almost saved. You saved. Amen. The blood took care of it. Hallelujah. A fatal blow to Satan. Satan had no idea what was going on. He, he got sucker punched. Hallelujah. Didn't see it coming. Hallelujah. But when he died on the cross, he did it for us and did, did, to take out that devil. There's a fountain of grace open that will flow forever. Oh, I'm a misfit of the grace of God. I'm a black sheep. Hallelujah. Covered by the grace of God foundation of peace laid that will last forever. Our peace is now found in him. It's finished. Paid in full. Once the thing's paid for, you never have to pay for it again. I paid off my truck. They ain't sent me a bill since. You know why? Paid in full. When you pay something off, you get it. If they send you a note, that's a scammer. That's a devil. Watch out for them. They try. They try. Hallelujah. It's finished. We believe. I believe. This book believes that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born again. 
And then no degree of reformation, however great, no attainments, immorality, no matter how high, no culture, however attractive, no baptism can help the sinner take even one step toward heaven. But a new nature imparted from above, a new life implanted by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God is essential for salvation. And only those thus saved are the children of God. I am so thankful that when I got born again, I had such teachers and preachers around me that reminded me it was the blood plus nothing. Amen. That I didn't have a group of, of, of preachers that tried to drive me into, you got to work, you got to dress a certain way, you got to act. It's, it's, listen, God taught me how to dress. God's taught me how to talk. Amen. God teaches you how to think. You work out your salvation. God saved you. It's finished. Our redemption has been accomplished solely by the blood of Jesus, who's made, who's made to be sin. It's made it. A curse for us, dying in our place instead, and no feeling, no good resolution, no sincere effort, no submission to the rules and regulations of any church, nor all the church. And I have people say, what are y'all's regulations? What are y'all's laws? How do I become a member? What do I got to go through? To I left all that behind so many years ago. I had a man send me a message this morning. He said, call me when you got time. I wrote him back and said, I'm never busy. 7.30 this morning, I'm never busy. I called him 10 minutes later. He said, you weren't lying. He said, I refuse. I'm effective. Change the way I think. Change the way I talk. Change the way I act. Paid in full. Two things happened. Two things happened when Jesus said, it is finished. Can you imagine the pain of saying that? He had to push himself up on that spike. He had to get enough breath. And he said, it is finished. And with those words, no matter if it was extremely loud or as loud as he could do it, Matthew tells us when he cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rock split. There are those that, that don't understand that there was a temple there. And in, in that temple, they had sacrificed lambs on that day. Of, Jesus crucified on the day of Passover. It's prophetic, man. The Lamb of God gave his blood on that day. And they're, crucif they're, they're, they're slaughtering lambs. And they're taking the blood. And they're putting it on their hands. And they're offering it before God like the Old Testament. And they're walking into this thick curtain that's as thick as a man's hand. And it's hanging up in the air. It took over 300 priests to hang this curtain. It's like a wall of fabric. And that priest would slip in behind there. And he would talk to God and offer uh, uh, our sins up to him. And ask God through that lamb out there that, that God would forgive them. And there on the hill of Golgotha, the lamb of God. And when he said, it's finished, the curtain tore from top to bottom, not bottom, up, top to bottom. The hand of God tore that thing, split it open. And it wasn't to let us in, but it was to let God out. So many times we put God in a box. We set God in a corner. And we say, God, you, you stay there till I need you in school. You stay there till I need you at work. You stay there until somebody passes and, I, and, and I'm in remorse and I need to talk to you. God said, I don't want to, I can't, this is, not, this is not how it was meant to be. I want to be out here with you. I want to be in school with you. I want to be at work with you. I want to be at home with you. I want to be in life with you. I want to stay with you. This is what God wanted. So when it, it tore, everything he did at that moment was for us now. So that tears. And then the scripture says, and this is what blows my mind, the earth shook. And the rock split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. I thought about that. Pastor Joseph. Why, why, what, what is it about these? It was, they were holy. In other words, these were people that did everything they could to do the right thing. And God said, I think I'm going to reward y'all a little early. I'm going to let you die twice. <laughs> you know they had to die twice. They get up and they walk around. They were resurrected. Just like Lazarus was resurrected. The widow of Cain's son was resurrected. They got up and come up out the grave. Now, I know you're thinking they come up out of the ground like, Bleh. no. 
they were in tombs. They were in tombs. So they just hopped up out of the tomb. The sinew and the muscle wrapped back around their bodies again. They took off the, the death clothes and they walked out. Can you imagine walking down the road and, and all of a sudden somebody's standing there on the side and they look up and go, Grandpa. <laughs> what up, Unc? Mom? What an amazing time. See, some folk have no idea all the things that Jesus did for us. And I don't have to try to understand it. I just believe it. When the centurion, which is the soldier, and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake, all that had happened, they were terrified, and they explained, surely he was the Son of God. He's not guilty. He's not wicked. He's the Son of God. The veil ripped. It's the last barricade between the father and his kids. Put it simply, he paid it all. He paid it all. Last scripture, Hebrews 10, 11. Every priest goes to work at the altar each day, offers the same old sacrifice. For thousands of years, offered the same old sacrifice. Year in, year out. Never makes a dent in the sin problem. Your hard work makes no dent in the sin problem. Your giving makes no dent in the sin problem. It's our belief in what he did for us. As a priest, see, Jesus was three things. Right? He was a prophet, he was a priest, and he was a king. He's the only one that carried all three offices, prophet, priest, and king. And as a priest, Christ made a single sacrifice for sins, and that was it. Then he sat down at the right hand. See, left, right. At the right hand. See, it's symbolic. Right hand of God and waited for his enemies to cave in. You know what he's watching right now? The enemies caving in. They caving in. Heads bowed, eyes closed just for a moment. It may look like your last hour. The sun has stopped shining. But with one sentence from Jesus' lips, he can tear through the curtain that has divided you from him. With one finger, he can tear it from top to bottom. He's the God of reconciliation, conversion, the commission to take care of others. And then he conquered. It is finished. He finished his mission. Have you made peace with God? Do you understand? It's not about this coming Sunday. It's about today. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that I make up my mind. Today is the day that I say, you did all that for me, Jesus? How can I go on living the way I've been living? If you've been away from God, put your hand up right now. Just put your hand up right now. Don't you? Don't be shy. Just throw that hand up. There you go. Thank you. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Several hands. Thank you. See, I believe God's going to change your life right now. I was in a simple service in 1979, because I did the same thing. And God never left me alone. He came out from that curtain, and he hung out with me. He's never left me alone. Hold those hands up again. We're going to pray this together. Forgive me, Jesus. Come on, say it. Forgive me, Jesus. Change my life. I need you. I've tried to do it on my own. It's not about my works. It's what you did. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your sacrifice. Help me serve you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.